Let's turn in our Bibles now to Ezekiel chapter 44 as we are coming towards the close of the prophecy. Ezekiel had prophesied the fall of Jerusalem and after Jerusalem fell and word came, then the prophecies of Ezekiel went out towards the future. So the early part of the book of Ezekiel is filled with a lot of warnings, dire warnings of the dark times, of the difficult times. But then the prophecies after those difficult times came and Jerusalem fell, then the prophecies turned towards the future. God never ends the story on a dark note. Sometimes we think that the story is going to end on a dark note. And we get all fearful and filled with anxiety and we think, oh my, what are we going to do? But it's glorious to me to realize God never ends the story on a dark note. He always points out to the bright and glorious future. Now, as the Bible prophesied of the days in which we live, it was again like Ezekiel's prophecies concerning the fall of Jerusalem. They're very dark. They're very dismal. As you read the book of Revelation and you read of the things that are going to take place on this earth during the Great Tribulation, they are very dark, dismal days indeed. But the book of Revelation doesn't end with the dark, dismal days of the Great Tribulation. But again, the book of Revelation ends in the glory of heaven. So Ezekiel takes you through the dark days that were going to come. Once those days had been fulfilled, then Ezekiel's prophecies turned towards the glorious future that God has for Israel. Even as the book of Revelation takes us to the glorious future that God has for the church. So the end of the story is always glorious. Sometimes you get some pretty dark chapters and life will lead you through some pretty dark experiences. But know this, God never ends the story in darkness, but always in glorious victory, the ultimate victory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and that's what I love about the Bible is that it is a book that always leads us towards the light of the future, the glorious future of God's people. So as we are in these final chapters of Ezekiel, he is actually prophesying of the period in which Jesus Christ will be ruling and reigning over the earth for a thousand years. We are beyond the tribulation days. We've come into the time of, of the reign of Jesus Christ for a thousand years over the earth. Again, Israel is to be restored as God's people. The worship will be restored in the temple uh, the priesthood will be restored. Now, it is important to realize that the place of the church in this kingdom age is different from the place of Israel. You see, as we are dealing with Israel in the kingdom age, you have to realize that these Israelites are not in their glorified bodies. We will be in our glorified bodies. This corruption will have put on incorruption. This mortal will have put on immortality. 
we will be in that, in that higher degree of in our new bodies. As Paul the Apostle was talking to the Corinthians, he said, we know that when this earthly body is dissolved, when it goes back to the dust, we have a building of God that's not made with hands eternal in the heavens, a new body, glorious new body. And we will be in our glorified body, but Israel will have survived the great tribulation period. God will have sealed 144,000 of them, and others will flee and be protected uh, from the Antichrist and his fury. Uh, and when the Lord comes again, there will be many of Israel who have lived through and survived the great tribulation, but they are still in their mortal bodies. And thus still being in their mortal bodies, their bodies will be subject unto death. And so there will be those who will die during the kingdom age because they have not yet uh, received their glorified bodies because they have lived through and survived the great tribulation and lived on into the kingdom age. And so it's important as we read these things, we'll be reading of, of death. And you say, well, how is it that there will be no death if Satan is bound and uh, is in the uh, buso for this thousand-year period of time? How is it there will be death? Well, there will still be people who have lived through the tribulation into the kingdom age who are still living in their normal physical bodies. They have not yet gone through that metamorphosis and received their new body, the building of God not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. So uh, with that kind of a background, we've already looked at the, uh, at the temple that is to be built where the worship will again be inaugurated. And in chapter 44, we are introduced to uh, a leader who is known as the prince, who is a vice regent here upon the earth. Uh, he leads in the worship of God. Uh, he has uh, he sort of God's... Uh, man upon the earth, probably a descendant of David, but he is not the promised Messiah. Jesus, the promised Messiah, will, of course, be in the new Jerusalem come, that comes down from God out of heaven and reigning over all. But this one is there in Israel, and uh, he has a portion of the land given to him, very prominent place, he has a very prominent place in the uh, leading of the people, uh, especially in their worship. Now, as we looked at the temple diagram last week, we saw that there were gates on the north and the south and upon the east. The gate on the east is the one that we'll be looking at for a little bit tonight. He brought me back by the way of the gate of the outward sanctuary, which looks toward the east, and it was shut. Then the Lord said unto me, This gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened. No man shall enter in by it, because the Lord, the God of Israel, hath entered in by it. Therefore it is, shall be shut. For it is for the prince, the prince, he shall sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the porch of that gate and shall go out by the way of the same. So it's for the exclusive use of the prince. He enters in and goes out by the way of this gate that is toward the east. The rest of the people come in the gates from the north or from the south. And as we will see tonight, if you enter in, to the place of worship from the north gate, you have to exit by the south. If you enter in by the south gate, you have to exit by the north. The gate that is toward the east, toward the Mount of Olives, as we mentioned last week, when Ezekiel saw the Spirit of God leaving, uh, the Spirit of God rested over the threshold of the gate towards the east, and then on the Mount of Olives, and then away. 
You remember that when Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he made it from the Mount of Olives. He descended from the Mount of Olives and came on in to the city of Jerusalem. It is quite possible that he came in through the east gate because that would be the direct route into the city from the Mount of Olives in those days. And so uh, when he comes again, he will set his foot on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah tells us, and it will split, create a new valley. And as he comes in again, uh, no doubt the Spirit of God returning, coming from the way of the east, as Ezekiel saw him, entering through the east gate, and again God's Spirit resting there in the place of his sanctuary in the midst of the people. And so uh, because the Lord enters in by this gate, it is shut. It isn't a common gate used for everyone, but only for this prince. And he enters in by the porch of the gate, and he eats there in the porch the, the gate is a is a has porch and and all it, it's a it's not just a door but it is a room and a uh, little uh, uh, sub rooms and so forth it's quite an elaborate thing if you go to jerusalem today uh, you can uh, see the gate of damascus the damascus gate there and uh, you'll see that it is uh it's it's it, you come into the entrance and then you make a right turn and then you make a, uh, another right turn as you, you come on into the city. And in this area within the gate, they have little shops, but off to the side of the gate, especially the old gate of Damascus, on down below, there is even a large quarters for the guards down there. There was a spiral staircase that went up to the top of the wall. And uh, so the gates were, were more than just a gate itself, but there are porches and all within the gates. And this is where this prince will uh, eat and all. Now, an interesting thing, uh, when uh, the present wall was built around Jerusalem, uh, part of it was built over the top of uh, the wall that was there at the time of Herod. Uh, and as you're in Jerusalem, you can see portions of the wall of Nehemiah's time. And uh, it's interesting, uh, the excavations that have been made and the history that you can see often confirming what the uh, Bible says uh, of these various broad walls and uh, where it talks about them taking down the houses to fortify the broad wall. You can actually see the houses that have been taken down. The footings of the houses are still there, but they were used to strengthen the broad wall, and they've uncovered all of that, and it's quite fascinating. But when the present wall was built by Suleiman in about 465 in that area, uh, 14 rather, 65 in that area uh, of time, and uh, some uh, Muslim, evidently, because it was under their control from the time that Solomon had, uh, Solomon had built this, uh, read this prophecy in Ezekiel and not quite understanding uh, the, this, what the Ezekiel was talking about, saw that the Lord was going to enter by the east gate and so they sealed up the east gate of the Solomon Wall. And you go there today and you find the east gate is all sealed up. They figured that they would stop the Messiah from coming into Jerusalem uh, by uh, sealing up that east gate. And uh, so you go there today and you see that east gate sealed. But that is not the gate that uh, Ezekiel is talking about, but it does make it interesting uh, to go to Jerusalem and see the east gate all blocked up and you can't, uh, of course, get through it because of these huge stones uh, by which they have blocked the east gate. Uh, but he brought me by the way of the north gate. Now, ev evidently, they went from this east, east gate. They went around now to the north gate before the house. And I looked, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord 
and I fell upon my face. Oh, how wonderful. The glory of God returns and is now again in the house of the Lord. And it, it's such an awesome thing for Ezekiel to behold this in this vision that he falls on his face in worship of God. And the Lord said unto me, Son of man, mark well. Now he's, he's told to be very careful now. Mark this well. Behold with your eyes and hear with your ears. Now pay close attention. The Lord's really putting an emphasis upon this. Of all that I say unto you concerning all of the ordinances of the house of the Lord and all the laws and mark well the entering in of the house with every going forth of the sanctuary. Make careful note of these things, for it sh you shall say to the rebellious, even to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, O ye house of Israel, let it suffice you of all your abominations. You, you know, let it be finished. You've done enough in the abominable things. Now, let it be sufficient in that you have brought into my sanctuary strangers uncircumcised in heart uncircumcised in flesh to be in my sanctuary to pollute it even my house when you offer my bread and the fat and the blood and they have broken my covenant because of all of your abominations and you have not kept the charge of my holy things, but you have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. Now, when the temple was built, they had the court of the Gentiles, where the Gentiles could come. But then there was a wall, and there were signs warning the Gentiles not to come in beyond that wall or they would be killed. It was just for the Jews. And then, of course, they had the inner court, was, which was for the priest, and then the Holy of Holies, which was just for the high priest. So the closer you got to God, the more exclusive it became. Gentiles were on the outside of the First of all, the court of the Gentiles, then, then the court of the women where the Jewish women could come in, then the men, inner yet, and then further on in, the priests, and then right into the Holy of Holies, the high priest, where he went into the presence of God uh, to intercede for the people and for the nation. So, when the church is taken out of the earth at the rapture. And the Lord then begins to deal directly with Israel, the nation of Israel again. Israel will, first of all, be deceived by the Antichrist, who will make a covenant with them and no doubt in that covenant make provision for them to build some sort of a temple or a place to reinstitute their worship. And they will begin again daily prayers and sacrifices. For we are told that in the midst of this seven year period or after three and a half years, the Antichrist will come into the Holy of Holies of the rebuilt temple and profane it. And he will cause the daily sacrifices to cease and he will set up the abomination which will bring the desolation or the great tribulation upon the earth, the final straw of man's um, insults to God. As the Antichrist comes to the temple of God, shows that he is God and demands to be worshipped of God and leaves the image of himself in the Holy of Holies of that temple that they will build. Now, this is probably what Ezekiel is here referring to in that the, the uncircumcised of heart and flesh have been allowed to come into that, uh, into that holy place, into the sanctuary of God. 
And so the Lord is, is saying to Ezekiel, now make sure you listen to this and warn the people and tell the people this. Uh, you, the abominations are, you know, you've gone far enough. You've brought into my sanctuary strangers, the uncircumcised in heart and in flesh, to be in my sanctuary to pollute it, even my house, when you've offered my bread and the fat of the blood and so forth, because of all your abominations. You have not kept the charge of my holy things, but you have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. You haven't been diligent in watching over this house. You've allowed the abominations. It could be that, um, that some of those who will be uh, instituted as priests in uh, this period of time will, will sort of uh, be in uh, collusion with the Antichrist, allowing this to happen. Uh, because you see, they will, many of them, be deceived and, and worship him as the Messiah. He is the false Messiah, but he will be accepted by them as their Messiah. And uh, it is interesting that the Jews today are looking for the Messiah to come. Uh, all over Israel, they have banners on the buildings and all that, that just uh, say the Messiah is coming. And uh, there is an anticipation among many of the Jews, uh, and they believe that the Messiah will lead them into the rebuilding of the temple, and that is how they tell you they will identify the Messiah. How will you know the true Messiah? He'll lead us in rebuilding the temple. So with this covenant made by the Antichrist with the Jews, Daniel chapter 9, they rebuild the temple, and many of them will be acclaiming him as their Messiah. And so when he comes, then it's nothing for them to allow him into the temple uh, and uh, to be acclaimed there as the Messiah, polluting, polluting the holy things. And so the Lord, thus saith the Lord God, no stranger uncircumcised in heart nor uncircumcised in flesh shall enter into my sanctuary of any stranger that is among the children of Israel. Again, the exclusion of those who are not God's people. And the Levites that are gone away from me, those that uh, allowed these abominations, that went astray from me with their idols, they shall even bear their iniquity. Yet they will have. A, they can be the those who just take care of the charge of things. They they oversee. They carry out the ashes and and they do the menial task. But they are not allowed to offer the sacrifices. Um, they have charge of the gates of the house and ministering of the house and and they do the work of of. Uh, uh, of offering, uh, they shall slay for the burnt offering, the sacrifice of the people. They shall stand before them to minister to them because they ministered unto them before their idols and they caused the house of Israel to fall in their iniquity. Therefore, I've lifted my hand against them, saith the Lord God. They will bear their iniquity. They shall not come near unto me to do the office of the priest. They do more the menial labors, but not exercising the office of the priest, nor to come near to any of my holy things in the most holy place of the holy of holies, but they shall bear their shame and their abominations which they've committed. But I will make them keepers of the charge of the house for all of the service thereof and for all that shall be done therein. But the priest of the Levites, who are the descendants of Zed Zedok, who kept the charge of the sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray, they will be the ones that will come in and, and do the priestly task. Uh, they will be the ones who stand before God uh, to offer the sacrifices, the fat and the blood, saith the Lord. They shall enter into my sanctuary and come near my table to minister unto me, and they shall keep my charge. 
And it shall come to pass that when they enter into the gates of the inner court, that is the priest, the descendants of Zadok, they shall be clothed with linen garments, no wool, uh, while they minister within the inner court. Uh, they will have linen bonnets and linen breeches on their loins. They are not to wear anything that causes sweat. Uh, the, the Lord doesn't want that ministry to him uh, to be a laborious fleshly thing, something that causes sweat. Um, I wonder about... Um, uh, some of these preachers that I've seen. Uh, and when they go forth into the outer court, the court of the people, they put off the holy garments that they've worn before the Lord. They had this room, the, the chamber for the priest. And they go into the chamber uh, and they put on the clothes that they then go into the inner chamber to minister to the Lord. Uh, but then when they come out of the inner chamber, they enter back into the priest chamber, change their garments again uh, to their street clothes before they come out and meet the people. Now, they are not to shave their heads, nor to allow their hair to grow long. <laughs> In other words, they just have reasonable haircuts. Uh, but they shall pull, which means they shall cut their hair, uh, but they're not to let it grow real long, nor are they to shave it. Neither shall any priest drink wine when they enter into the inner court. Now, uh, in the book of Proverbs, we are told that wine is not for kings. Uh, the priests weren't to drink wine when they were ministering unto the Lord. The Lord didn't want any uh, ministry that came from a false stimulant. Uh, he didn't want anybody to worship him with a fuzzy mind. Uh, it is interesting in the New Testament that as Paul lays out for Timothy the uh, requirements for the uh, Bishops in the church, the overseers of the church, they were not to be given to wine. Uh, and so if you are ministering uh, unto the Lord and unto the people, uh, you're not to be given to wine. If you have a place and a position within the church of, of eldership or bishopric, uh, overseeing, uh, you're not to be given to wine. And uh, so neither shall they take for their wives a widow, nor her that has been divorced. They couldn't worry, marry a widow or a divorced woman, with the exception that if the widow was the wife of a priest, then he could marry her. Uh, but he was to actually take a, one of the young maidens, a virgin, from the seed of the house of Israel. He wasn't to marry a non-Israelite. Uh, and uh, then the duties of the priest were, first of all, verse 23, to teach the people, instructing the people uh, in the difference between that which is profane and that which is holy, so that the people can discern between what is clean and unclean. Secondly, in controversies, they were to stand in judgment. They were to be judges. Uh, and uh, they were to uh, give uh, the decisions concerning controversies, controversies that would ri arise among the people. They will judge according to my judgments. Again, going back to the judgments that God had established in the Mosaic Law. And then thirdly, they were to keep my laws and my statutes. They were to uh, keep them in the sense of, of uh, making certain that they were kept. They were more or less in charge of seeing that the statutes and uh, the commandments of the law, of the law were kept uh, in all of the assemblies when the people would come in to make sure that they uh, 
were abiding by the rules and, and all that God had established. And finally, they were to hallow the Sabbaths. Uh, they uh, were to uh, be there to minister unto the people on these holy days. Now, here again, uh, we find out that people will be dying in this period of time, uh, during this thousand year reign. They shall come at no dead person, because under the law, to touch a dead person, uh, you were unclean, you had to go through a certain ceremonial uh, kind of a, a ritual for cleansing before you could come back into the temple or into the tabernacle to worship God. So they were to not come to any dead person to defile themselves, uh, but for their father or for their mother or son or daughter or brother or for a sister that had no husband, they may then touch those bodies. After they are cleansed, they shall then count seven days and in that day that he goes into the sanctuary, into the inner court to minister in the sanctuary, he shall first of all offer a sin offering, saith the Lord God. And it shall be unto them for an inheritance. For the Lord said, I am their inheritance. And you shall give them no possession in Israel. I am their possession. Now, they were given places to live. There was a uh, there's a certain part of the land that was allotted to uh, the priest and then another part that was allotted to the Levites just north, the area north of the sanctuary. We will see that in a little while this evening. And there are 20 cities for the priest. But yet uh, the Lord is their inheritance and he is their possession. They shall eat the meal offerings, the sin offering, the trespass offering, and every dedicated thing in Israel shall be theirs. Now, when would people would bring their sacrifices to the Lord, the sin offerings or the meal offerings, which were uh, grain, sort of a bread, uh, that they would make with the oil and the flour, uh, the priest would get a portion of that, uh, lamb or ox or whatever, and it was for the priest. And, uh, the rest would be sacrificed to the Lord. Note the only offering of which they do not eat is the burnt offering because in the burnt offering it was totally consumed. The animal was totally consumed except for the hide on the altar. And uh, the burnt offering being the consecration, when you consecrate your life to the Lord, it, it should be total, it should be complete. The whole thing, you know, not, well, Lord, I'll give you, you know, this day or I'll give you so many hours or, uh, you know, and, and we are prone to sort of a portion out to God. You, you can have this corner over here and you can have this part over here and, and, and all, but yet the real consecration is complete. It's total. So the burnt offering, which was the offering of consecration, was to be totally consumed. And thus the priest did not get any part of the burnt offering. But all of their meats and flour and so forth was supplied through these offerings that the people brought because a certain portion then would go to the priest and that way they didn't have to uh, uh, have their own fields of grain or they didn't have to raise their own cattle or sheep or whatever because their... Uh, the Lord was their inheritance and their possession, and that which was brought to the Lord, they got their portion of those things as, as the payment, so to speak, for their ministry unto the people and their ministry to the Lord. And the final commandment of this chapter is that they are not to eat anything that dies of itself. If you find something that's dead, uh, he, they weren't to eat of it. I, I don't think I would want to either. But uh, then when you will divide the land by lot or by a lot month, it should be because they're not going to be casting lots. They did do that in, in Joshua's time. But now in Ezekiel prophesies the, the portions of the land that are given to each tribe and there's no casting of lots 
but the allotment, and so it should better read, uh, by allotment, the land for the inheritance, you shall offer a oblation unto the Lord, a holy portion of the land. Uh, so a part of the land just belongs to God, and it shall be the length of 25,000, and notice the word reads in your King James is in italics, which means that that has been inserted by the translators. Uh, in the Hebrew text, it doesn't give you any measurement, reads, cubits, or whatever. And thus, that's all commentators need to be completely divided, is for the Lord not to spell out specifically. And so you have a group of com commentators who say it's cubits, and a group of commentators that say it is reads. A reed is about 10 feet. If indeed the, the translators are correct in inserting reeds, uh, it would mean that this portion of the land for the Lord in which the holy sanctuary would be in the, in, in the uh, central portion of the land, this portion for the Lord would be about 47 and a half miles long and it would be uh, 10,000, uh, and again, they, they, they've, uh, they, they haven't inserted, but just 10,000 uh, wide. And if, again, if it's reeds, it means it would be about 18 miles wide and about 47 miles long. Uh, and then the sanctuary within itself, the place for the sanctuary would be uh, 500, and again, if it's reeds, you're talking about almost a mile square in the middle of this land. And this is that land that is dedicated to the Lord. Uh, it is the place of his sanctuary. Now, just north of it would be the place for the priest, immediately north. And it would be not quite as wide, but the same width, 5,000 would be the breadth and, again, 25,000 the width. And then north of that, the place for the Levites, which, again, would be the same as this, uh, 10,000 uh, by 25,000, or, again, if it's reeds, 47 and a half uh, miles by uh, 18 miles. So... The holy portion of the land shall be for the priests, the ministers. Next week, I'll bring you a diagram uh, of the, and we'll pass it out like we did last week, of when we get to the apportioning of the land, the tribe of Dan, and Asher, Naphtali, and so forth, we will, we will bring you a diagram so then you can see how the whole land is to be apportioned. Uh, now, no doubt... There's going to be tremendous geographical changes of the land before this happens. Because when you get into the tribulation period, the earth is going to be in upheaval. Islands are going to flee. There will be whole new mountain ranges formed. Mountains will disappear. Uh, there's going to be a whole cataclysmic kind of... Uh, Changes that will be taking place on the earth during the Great Tribulation period. There was an interesting article a couple of weeks ago in Newsweek magazine. I don't know if you saw that. It, uh, sort of a doomsday kind of an article in Newsweek uh, where it uh, talked about uh, all of these asteroids and uh, comets and all that are out here in space and how that uh, the earth has had a near miss with many of these asteroids. In fact, just a couple of years ago, uh, one came within about 10 million miles of the earth. And uh, the article uh, talks about the fear that the scientists have of one day one of these asteroids impacting the earth and uh, say one that was the size of, of this building. And, uh, or one that would be a mile in, uh, in uh, or in there are some up to 10 miles. The one that just missed us a while back was about five miles uh, across. But if one, uh, and the thing is, 
We didn't even know it was coming. We, we try to keep track of all of them. We know there are a lot of them out there. We've tracked their orbits. We know when they'll be back towards the Earth again. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's sort of like Halley's Comet. We, we know when the thing is going to return. There are other comets that they've tracked their orbits, and we know when they'll be coming back towards the Earth. Uh, but with these asteroids, we can't always pick them up. And uh, this one that came by, uh, the flyby, uh, just a couple years ago, we didn't really see it until after it was gone. And uh, the, the scientists have actually made contingency plans. Uh, if we see one, uh, that is, uh, its orbit is apt to bring it into a collision with the Earth, uh, they, they plan to send out a rocket with an uh, atomic weapon to blow the thing up before it can uh, reach us here. And uh, it is a concern among the scientists that the Earth could very well be destroyed by an impact. And they point back to 1906 when uh, whatever it was, asteroid or whatever, it hit up near Siberia and, and created that... Uh, Tremendous devastation of the forest, flattening trees for hundreds of miles. Uh, was, the sound of the thing was heard as far away as Moscow. And, and uh, they, they talk about these kind of things. Of course, out near Winslow, Arizona, you have that meteorite crater out there. Uh, that, and they say that meteorite was only about the size of a car, but it created a, creator, a crater that is about a mile across and, and several hundred feet deep, or a couple thousand feet deep, I guess. And so uh, these things are, are quite interesting. And in the book of Revelation, as John describes some of the things that are happening, these fireballs from heaven and so forth, it sounds like uh, perhaps uh, there will even be uh, what was described in Newsweek magazine. So you might get that issue. Um, it, um, I, I think Newsweek has gone up to, uh, it's 295, but uh, <laughs> it was a worthwhile uh, article in it if you like to get scared. And, uh, <laughs> but we do know that there will be, during the tribulation period, tremendous cataclysmic upheavals of the whole geography of the earth, so that just what the geography will be like in the kingdom age, we are not certain. But we do have how the land will be apportioned, and we will uh, look at the apportionment of the land uh, next week for all of the tribes. But this is the Lord's portion. It has to do right there with Jerusalem, just south of the area that's for the Lord here, described here for the Lord, is the city of Jerusalem and uh, the place uh, around the city of Jerusalem. And then outside of this perimeter, on either end, east and west, is the place for the prince. And, and quite a large portion of land is allotted for this prince uh, who is mentioned here. So, uh, in fact, we get to that in verse 7. The portion for the prince uh, on the side and on the other side of the oblation of the holy portion. So this portion we described uh, by 47 and a half miles by uh, 18 miles or so. Just on the outside perimeters, east and west, the portion for the prince. Uh, and uh, then uh, the land shall be his possession in Israel. My princes shall no more oppress my people. Uh, and the rest of the land shall they give to the house of Israel according to their tribes. And we get that in the last chapter of Ezekiel. Thus saith the Lord God, let it suffice you, O princes of Israel. Here's what God's asking them to do. Remove violence and spoil. Execute judgment and justice. Take away your taxations. Ooh, all right. <laughs> Saith the Lord God. <laughs> I want a fair judicial system. Fair court system. Get rid of the gangs and the violence. And stop the taxation. I'll vote for that. 
And you shall have just balances. It used to be that the United States had a bureau known as the Standard Weights and Measures uh, to make sure that a pound was a pound. Uh, when I was working in the market, we used to have these fellows come from the National Bureau of Standards of Weights and Measures, and they would have these little uh, weights, pounds and five pounds, and they'd put them on the scales in the market, you know, where you check out uh, when they put the vegetables out there, you, you know, you, you're paying $1.49 a pound for a tomato. And so they put this little, isn't that horrible? Uh, <laughs> they put this little pound weight on to make sure that the scale says one pound. They go around to the service stations and they pu put a gallon of gas uh, into the uh, container to make sure that what says a gallon on the, on the meter is, is a true gallon of gas. And, uh, the importance of maintaining a standard of weights and measures. Um, in England, there is a case recorded uh, where a baker took a farmer to court and he charged the farmer with cheating him. He said that when he first began, they, they, they would trade the bread for the butter. The baker would bring him out bread and he would trade for butter. And he said when he first started this exchange, he was getting a, a full pound of butter. But gradually, the farmer was cutting the butter down. Until now, he was only getting three quarters of a pound of butter uh, for, you know, uh, instead of the full pound. And he was accusing the farmer of cheating him. And so when the farmer got up to defend himself, he said, well, judge, he said, my problem is that the only scales I have are balance scales. And so he said, all I did was take his pound of bread and put it on the scale and uh, measured out his pound of butter, you know, with the balance scales. And so he won his case, uh, but, uh, that's why it is important that you have a standard for weights and measures. And that's what God is asking here. Be exact. Let, you know, this, and it gives the list of measures, and they mean nothing to you, an ephath or a bath or a hen or a homer or whatever. Homer means something to you, but not what it means here. Uh, and uh, so uh, have your... Make sure that they're exact, that you, you have exact balances, that, you are, uh, that your measuring is all standardized. And then in the offering of the offerings, they are then to use these measurements. And he goes on to uh, give in, in the uh, offering of the various offerings, that the measurements that are then used as they were standardized in verses 9 and 10. And then uh, for the prince, the people were to give to him one lamb out of the flock, out of every 200. So out of every 200 lambs that they have in their flock, the prince gets one. Uh, and then for the meal offering and for the burnt offering and the peace offerings to make reconciliation for them, saith the Lord God, all of the people of the land shall give this oblation for the prince in Israel. And it shall be the prince's part to give them the burnt offerings and the meal offerings and the drink offerings in the feast and the new moons, the Sabbaths, and all the solemnities of the house of Israel. He shall prepare the sin offering and the meal offering, the burnt offering, the peace offerings to make reconciliation for the house of Israel. So you find the prince here is involved in offering the sacrifices for the whole house of Israel. Now there is nothing said concerning a high priest in this rejuvenating of the temple. It would seem that the prince more or less has that position that the high priest once had. But Jesus is our great high priest. 
And there is now only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So even in the reestablishing of the temple worship, no high priest is mentioned but this prince who does the offering of these various offerings for the people. And then in the first day or the first month, the first day of the month, uh, he is to uh, offer this bullock without blemish to cleanse his sanctuary. He is to repeat that on the seventh day to take the blood, put it on the corners and on the, uh, uh, the, the horns of the altar, the settle of the altar, the horns, and on the posts of the gate of the inner court. And uh, do that on the seventh day. And uh, they, they do it for all those that err and those that are simple. <laughs> and so shall you reconcile the house. And in the first month, the 14th day, which would be the time of the Feast of Passover, they are to celebrate the fe Feast of Passover. Now, there will be two feasts that will celebrate it, uh, the, peace, uh, the Feast of Passover and the Feast of um, Tabernacles will be celebrated, but the Feast of Pentecost will not be celebrated, which is interesting, and I suppose uh, people can find some spiritual significance for that. Uh, it could be that the Passover instituted the initiation of, of the church, and, and the church now has a whole new position. Uh, it foreshadowed the church. Uh, the church was born on, on, the, on the day of the Feast of Pentecost, and that gave birth to the church, and the church, of course, now has a whole new position, so that feast is not celebrated, but the tabernacles and Passover are celebrated. And uh, so it goes on to uh, tell of the uh, sacrifice of the bullock and so forth for the uh, feast of the Passover. Maybe we should take 46 next week and, and uh, perhaps we can finish Ezekiel next week and include 46 uh, in the study next week uh, because we're running out of time and uh, I, I will have the charts for you next week and uh, so if you've read chapter 46 already for tonight it's not going to hurt you to read it again uh, next week maybe you'll even understand it a little better after having this kind of a background this evening and, uh, and, and um, so we'll, we'll go ahead with that portion next week. Father, thank you again for the hope that you give us for the future. That though we might be going through dark days, the story never ends in darkness. But in that glorious work of the restoration of your glory and your presence. Lord, we thank you that the ultimate victory belongs to you. That you, Lord, shall indeed triumph over all of those forces of darkness that are dragging our world down into the pit. And Lord, how we long and pray for your kingdom to come, that your will might be done on this earth even as it is in heaven. Lord, we see the results of, of man trying to wrest the control and the rule from you. Lord, we see the calamities that have come upon our nation and are coming upon our nation because we as Israel have turned our backs upon you. And Lord, as we enter into this dark period of our history, sustain us by the power of your Holy Spirit and that hope of the future glory of the kingdom of God and the reign of righteousness of our glorious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And so, Lord, may we be strengthened and directed by your Spirit as we walk with you in fellowship this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we stand? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for 